These new super fast Surdes transceivers are awesome, aren't they? I mean, 58 gigabits per second, zoom! Oh, wait, be careful what you wish for. You know, being an astronaut sounds fun, too. Launching into orbit at amazing speed. But then there's that bulky suit you have to wear, years of training you have to complete, getting motion sickness and zero gravity. Oh, and the decent chance of burning up on re-entry. Never fun. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. With Surtees on our boards, we have massive signal integrity issues to resolve with our layouts and a confusing array of options, tools, and methods to navigate to get our system to both perform and conform. Luckily, my guest today is Christian Philippe from Mentor, a Siemens company, and he is going to help us sort out the best practices for Surtees implementation on our PCBs. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about this topic. Hi, Christian. Thank you so much for joining me. It's good to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so the challenges for my team doing Surtees design have gotten more and more difficult over the last several years. I'm curious about what kinds of trends you're seeing in Surtees design. Well, Amelia, the continuously growing demand for a higher bandwidth has driven the need for new protocols operating at higher data rates. As shown in this chart, in the 1990s, obtaining data rates of 10 megabit per second to 100 megabit per second was possible through protocols such as USB 1.1, 10 base D, and 100 base TX. In the early to mid-2000s, the growth of internet has pushed for faster speeds and new protocols such as USB 2.0, PCIe 1.0 and SATA 1.0 emerged. The data rates moved up and were consistently in the range of 1 gigabit per second to 3 gigabit per second. By the end of the decade, those speeds reached 10 gigabit per second and just a few years later they increased to 25, 28 gigabit per second and above. So are those the highest data rates that I can expect to achieve with my PCBs, or are we going to go higher? From the interaction we had with our customers, most of them, they are already designing at 56 gigabit per second using PAM4 modulation. But there are some new standards being developed right now that are aiming at 112 gigabit per second. Okay, let's talk about the various signal integrity methods a little bit. This is kind of a complicated question, but I will do my best to answer it. Different data rates are obviously posing different signal integrity problems. Consequently, they require different solutions. A summary of those possible factors affecting the channel's performance and the required analysis method at various data rates is shown in this table. The performance of protocols running at less than 1 gigabit per second was mostly affected by impedance discontinuities and trace length. Crosstalk was somehow important, but not as important as it is at higher data rates. At that time, only few people were simulating their designs at those speeds. As the data rates increased above 1 gigabit per second, loss started to become a limiting factor and the signal integrity simulations were required in order to make sure that the designs will properly work. A typical simulation deck at that time was consisting of a spice transmitter and receiver combined with lossy transmission lines. The eye diagrams measured at the receiver input were compared against an eye mask. A channel was compliant if the simulated eye was within the limits given in the specification for that particular protocol. For lossy channels, some feed for equalizer levels were applied on the transmitter side to compensate for the increased loss at high frequencies. Now, about 3 gigabit per second, the eye diagrams propped at the receiver pins were closed due to intersymbol interference, abbreviated ISI. ISI is an unwanted phenomenon that is essentially caused by the dispersion of the channel and consists of a form of distortion of a signal in which two consequent symbols interfere with each other. The use of equalization techniques at the receiver was needed to recover the signal and open those eyes. Same eye diagram measurement methods were used, but now the signals were probed at the slicer after the reference RX equalization was applied. Since the SPICE models became larger and more complicated, a need for standardization has pushed for the introduction of the IBCMI models. IBCMI models were more suitable for implementing signal processing techniques such as FFE, CTLE, and DFE, and were also protecting the IC vendor's IPs. 
So are the eye diagrams still what we're using for compliance when we're above 10 gigabits? Or do things get more complicated? Our days we see that uh, people are still trying to use IBCMI models for channels that are operating at higher data rates. But the newer specification have migrated to different compliance methods. Some of the specification for protocols operating near 10 gigabit per second have moved away from the eye diagram measurements to frequency domain metrics type of compliance methods. A set of frequency domain metrics and associated limits such as insertion loss, return loss, fitted attenuation, and insertion loss deviation were plotted and compared against specific limits or masks. If the passive performance figures meet or exceeded the masks, the channel was likely to operate at the required bit error rate. Crosstalk was also measured in frequency domain in the form of power sum differential, near end crosstalk, power sum differential, far end crosstalk, power sum differential crosstalk, and insertion loss to crosstalk ratio. All the frequency domain metrics defined above, except ICR, were declared independent of each other. Consequently, they did not allow for trade-offs between various channel impairments. This has led in practice either to over-design or to false positives or false negatives. As a result, a new compliance method called channel operating margin was introduced for some of the protocols operating at 25-28 gigabit per second and above. The computational algorithm is mathematically a subset of statistical analysis using single-bit pulse responses from S parameters of the victim and aggressor channels. Therefore, it is reasonable to compare COM with statistical eyes rather than with bit-by-bit analysis, which is often unable to provide sufficient sample size. I like the idea that there are victim and aggressor channels. So I know my team has had lots of challenges with Surdy's design in general. What challenges are your other customers seeing? We talk very often to our customers. We are getting many questions from them. But those that are most often coming up are the following. How do I know if the implementation is possible? How much variability can I have in the layout? What if I don't have models for my drivers or if I don't know what the drivers will be yet? How do I quickly validate an interface to a protocol standard? How can I model a long, high-speed channel with 3D features in a reasonable amount of time? How can I easily find problems in many service channels in my design? And also, how can I model and simulate hundreds of service lines? So let's talk specifically about your hyperlink signal integrity tool a little bit. The newest hyperlinks release, which is VX 2.3, addresses all the previously mentioned challenges through a new service set of wizards, especially designed to make the virtual compliance process painless. The input to the wizards can be either extracted as parameters, pre-layout line sim schematics, or routed PCBs in board sim format. If S parameters are being used, they can come from a large variety of sources such as measurements, hyperlinks, or third-party simulation tools. The new CERDIS wizards added in Hyperlinks VX 2.3 are mostly centered around compliance measurements, which can include eye diagrams, COM, frequency domain metrics, and time domain metrics, depending on the operating mode to be analyzed. For example, Ethernet, OIF, CI, and Fiber Channel use mostly frequency domain metrics or COM, while PCIe Gen3, Gen4, and USB 3.1 Gen1, Gen2 use eye diagrams. Additional metrics and intermediary results are computed and reported for debugging purposes. The HTML reports are organized such as to be easy to identify and distinguish between normative, informative, and additional information based on the specs requirements. So how many new CERTES wizards were added in the Hyperlinks VX 2.3 release? In the Hyperlinks VX 2.3 release, we added three different new wizards. One, which is compliance checks only, is being used just for the purpose of performing compliance checks. The other one, we call it batch simulation, allows for various other type of simulations besides the compliance checks. And finally, the third one that we call measureless parameters is similar to the other two compliance checks, but it operates on S parameters either from measurements or from third-party simulation tools. Okay, let's get into some detail. How do the CERDES wizards work? 
All of those CERDIS compliance wizards are similar in the sense that they accept a prescribed set of inputs such as protocol and operating mode or generation, stimulus conditions, compliance metrics and the associated limits, reference transmitter and receiver models, worst case transmitter and receiver packages, proper terminations, and various types of jitter. They operate as prescribed by the protocol specification and support adaptive equalization and various figures of merit for optimization, eye height, eye width, eye area, or signal-to-noise ratio. They also generate the required outputs in time and frequency domains, eye density plots, channel operating margin, insertion loss, return loss, insertion loss to cross-talk ratio, intermediate results and waveforms such as step and pulse responses, and also they provide the pass-fail characteristics. Okay, so about how many protocols are being supported in the Wizards? In this current release, we support over 30 operating modes, but we are working to add more. Okay, so can we take a look at the various different types of modeling choices we have and see what their main characteristics are and the advantages and disadvantages of using them? Some of the advantages of the behavior models are Those models are built based on a specific protocol or interface minimum requirements for transmitter and receiver. Consequently, they incorporate all the constraints defined in a specific standard. They are also easy to use and there is no setup required. The worst case transmitter jitter allowed by the protocol or interface is included in the model. They run much faster than IBCMI models and optimum equalization settings are quickly found by the EDA tool. They are suitable for channel optimization in pre-layout analysis phase and for screening in post-layout. The most important advantage of those models is their accuracy, which is not as good as of the IBCMI models. Okay, and how fast do the behavioral models run compared to IBIS-AMI? This is a very good question. We have seen IBCMI models for which a simulation runtime may be as high as 1 hour and 45 minutes, and that does not include any adaptation. So multiple sweeps are needed to find the optimum equalization settings. For the same channel, the compliance simulation with behavior models takes only a couple of seconds, typically less than a minute. All right, so tell me more about the IBIS AMI models. Well, as opposed to Behavior models, IBCMI models can accurately model the behavior of the actual devices used in the design. They are supposed to run on any EDA tool and produce similar results. They are widely available from various IC vendors, and potentially they can support multiple protocols or interfaces. But on the downside, some model makers are using unapproved IBIS syntax in their models, making those models work only in some EDA tools. Not every IC vendor provides models for their devices. Some of the models do not include transmitter jitter and the user has to account for it in the simulation tool, which is not a trivial task for many users. Some models are not self-adaptive, consequently finding the optimized equalization settings may be time-consuming, sometimes even prohibitive from a simulation point of view. Understanding IBCMI parameters and properly setting them up can be an intimidating task for many users, especially for non-signal integrity experts. Okay, I'm curious. How do the optimized equalization settings from the IBIS AMI simulations compare with those from compliant simulations with behavior models? In the IBIS AMI simulations, Unless the TX and RX models are using a communication mechanism such as a back channel, which is, by the way, an unapproved yet feature, the TX and RX are optimizing themselves independently of each other. While in compliance simulations, the mathematical algorithm has knowledge about the TX and RX equalization capabilities, so it can do a joint optimization quicker and more efficient than in IBCMA analysis. It actually is a common practice to run compliance simulation first, find the best equalization settings, and use them in the IBCMA simulations. Okay, and I've started to hear about COM, and you mentioned that earlier too. So what's the deal with COM? I'm getting very often this type of question because this is a new concept that was introduced in the IEEE specification in 2014. 
And in summary, we can say that channel operating margin is a die-to-die -die figure of merit, provided as a decibel ratio of sample available signal to noise with a certain threshold established to mitigate discrepancy between the reference chip design and the actual chip design performance. Many of those who are new to channel operating margin are asking why this figure of merit has been adopted as a compliance method and how different this is compared to the standard eye diagram and bit error rate or frequency domain type of simulations. And the answer to those questions is, channel operating margin simulations are very fast and are physically design agnostic, which means that they don't rely on IC vendor provided models. As opposed to frequency domain analysis, channel operating margin allows the trade-off between loss, reflections, crosstalk, and device specifications. Channel operating margin is widely accepted because it eliminates the complexity associated with the standard actual simulations, it takes shorter simulation time, can be used in both pre- and post-layout design stages, can be implemented with low cost, it protects the IC vendor's IP, and can be used to predict the performance across high volume manufacturing tolerances with design of experiment studies. So what are the advantages of using these CERDES wizards you're talking about? Well, the protocol compliance mode of the CERDES wizards in Hyperlinx VX 2.3 offer a series of advantages compared to generic simulators using other type of models. Some of those advantages are it is easy to use, eliminating the need for modeling or other signal integrity skill set. All the specification requirements are built in. Behavioral models are built in. It runs fast and it finds quickly the optimum equalization settings. It is in a way similar to CSIM, which is an open source tool developed and maintained by PCI SIG, but is fully automated, an easy to use environment from S parameter extraction to S parameter post processing. There is no need for manual manipulation of S parameters such as port mapping, cascading, etc. It is similar to the IEEE MATLAB script, but much faster and more reliable. The output of it includes comprehensive HTML reports. Since so much knowledge and automation is built in, it increases the user's productivity by orders of magnitude compared to the previous solutions. Okay, so as a data point, how fast is the CERTES wizard compared to the IEEE MATLAB script? Recently, we got some test cases for which the simulation runtime in MATLAB was 45 minutes, while for the same set of S4P files, hyperlinks takes only 4 minutes to solve. Okay, that's impressive. Next, can we back up a bit and can you walk me through the whole flow for doing a CERTES design? Although not new, a good design process for large service systems design should start early in the development cycle and should include several steps as depicted in the following flowchart. Solution space exploration with or without models is a step that can start even before having a detailed schematic for your interface and will allow you to get an initial understanding of the protocol used in the design. Units per million analysis is needed to establish how big the margin requirements need to be in order to meet the units per million target in high volume manufacturing. The routing constraints for the layout should be generated as a result of the UPM analysis and should be incorporated in the constraint manager tool. Creating the layout within the constraints and performing DRC checks prior to the final SIPI verification is also an important step. Verifying the post layout design based on the appropriate compliance methodology for the selected protocol is the proper procedure for a confident electrical sign off for your critical high speed service interfaces. Okay, let's walk through that process in more detail and start me with pre layout. What should my design flow look like there? Pre layout is the most critical stage of the design, and the designer's or signal integrity's engineer task is to optimize the controllable variables such as the product to meet the electrical performance, manufacturing requirements, target cost, time to market, etc. A possible design flow is to start with a simple topology that in this example includes a backplane channel with two daughter cards attached, but without connectors and differential vias. Using this topology and the informative differential insertion loss mask, the designer can fine-tune the trace geometry and select the proper material if the trace length is predefined, or 
Find the maximum trace length that will still meet the insertion loss requirements in the opposite situation. The next important step is to properly design the differential vias, DC blocking capacitors and connectors breakout structures. This can be done using the topology from the first step and adding into it those structures one at a time. All the available parameters shall be tuned such as to minimize the impedance discontinuities in the channel and the final topology to meet the differential return loss informative limit. Finally, in the last step of the design process, all the crosstalk channels with significant contribution shall be added. In this step, channel operating margin or bit error ratio analysis can be used to fine tune their interspacing for the desired margin. So, how can hyperlinks users optimize via and blocking capacitor structures? In the Hyperlinks VX 2.3 release, we added a new product which is called Hyperlinks 3D Explorer that can be used either in standalone mode or can be launched from Hyperlinks SIPI or Hyperlinks Advanced Solvers. This product is provided along with a number of predefined templates for single-ended and differential vias, DC blocking capacitors, and arrays of DOS. Hyperlinks 3D Explorer allows for solution space exploration using our hybrid or our full 3D full wave solvers. All right, one thing I'm wondering here, how do I make sure that when I build a million copies of my product, the yield will be high enough so I don't have a lot of failures and returns? Well, there are multiple ways to do that, but the simplest methodology involves few simulations capturing single point data or eventually a more complex flow that includes what if exploration analysis step. Although this methodology provides some insight about the performance of the design, it does not guarantee that the final product will work in high volume manufacturing. The statistical behavior of the system over high volume manufacturing can be modeled using a design of experiments. The design of experiments allows the development of a predictive response surface model with fewer data points than otherwise needed to exhaustively cover a parameter space. Alternatively, the simulated response can be fitted using an artificial neural network. Statistical conclusions about how signals change due to interconnect or silicon variations can be drawn from the RSM or ANN results. Empirical simulations of large distributions to understand statistical importance or defects per million is not necessary. Okay, so from your experience, how much calm margin needs to be built into a system that is required to meet that 3 dB threshold? This is an important question. In our 2017 design com paper with the title Optimized Methods for High-Speed Surface Channels Using COM Metric, we have demonstrated that additional 2 dB is needed to make sure that the failing parts per million percentage is near zero. And I definitely want my failing parts to be near zero. <laughs> okay, I'm ready to get into layout now. What's going to happen next? As a result of the solution space exploration and units per million analysis process, a set of routing constraints can be developed for the PCB layout. Those constraints are captured in the Constraint Manager tool and then implemented in the layout. When the PCB design is complete, the database can be exported in hyperlinks for post-route verification. And what kind of constraints are typically used in CERDES designs? There can be many constraints, but the usual constraints for CERDES designs are maximum routing length that is proportional to the maximum insertion loss that the equalization can compensate for, impedance discontinuities affecting the return loss, intra- and interpair length matching to avoid skew, maximum number of allowed vias, symmetry of the routing and stitching vias at each layer transition. Traces crossing gaps in reference plans are always a problem. Okay, so what if I've done my layout now and I'm ready to run my ERC? What happens next? The initial layout may have errors that could be caught early with advanced electrical rules checking that are built in Hyperlinks DRC. This tool has a standard set of rules focused on differential pairs, impedance, length and phase matching, reference plane changes, etc. Symmetry rules for VIA, component and stitching VIA placement. Including Hyperlinks DRC in the electrical sign-off process allows you finding many errors even before investing time and resources in modeling the channels. 
Okay, and I know in the old days we used to perform visual inspection of layout as part of the verification process. What are the advantages you see of using Hyperlinks DRC? Oh, I remember those old days, but now Hyperlinks DRC automates and speeds up the verification process that otherwise relies on the expertise of the designer. It's error-prone and time-consuming. Now, if I perform all of these pre-layout simulations, am I still going to need to do post-layout verification? This is an interesting question. While the pre-layout simulations are critical for reducing the number of iterations needed for a design and thus guaranteeing that the design has enough margins in high volume, there are several simplifications and assumptions that are being made here. Post-layout simulations could potentially catch some artifacts that were not accounted for in the pre-layout simulations. Moreover, it is possible that during the design process, not all the constraints that were defined in the pre-layout phase could be implemented in the real-life product. Since compliance simulation using channel operating margin or behavior models run much faster than IBCMI simulations, they can be used to quickly evaluate the performance of the channels under investigation through a screening process. Only those channels that are marginally passing or Failing compliance measurements require more accurate simulations, for example, time domain, bit by bit, or statistical using vendor provided IBCMI models. However, a difficult task for the designer is to establish the confidence threshold for channel operating margin, as, due to various differences in details, accordingly to some authors, the difference between channel operating margin and IBCMI simulations could be as much as several dB. Another limitation may be related to the diagram masks required for the pass-fail decision, which are not defined in the specifications and must be provided by the IC vendors. In order to be able to fix the failing channels, the designer has to identify the root cause of the failure. The frequency domain plots and masks, along with the TDR impedance plots, single bit responses and other intermediate results from the COM method can be helpful in this stage of the analysis. And then do I need to simulate all of the different pairs in my design using IBIS AMI models? As we already discussed, IBIS AMI simulations can be very slow, especially if the transmitter and receiver models are not adaptive. On very large designs, this may not be possible or can be a very slow process. Unless there are any issues with the setup, the compliance method should be accurate enough, so for nets that have enough margins, there is no need to resimulate them with IBCMI models. A few experiments can be run to gain trust in the correlation between the two simulation methods. Great, this has been a lot to take in, so can we go over your main points one more time? Sure. I think that in summary, we can say that the comprehensive hyperlinks design methodology covers all the design needs from concept to implementation. An easy to use schematic entry is used to model pre route channels and to help developing constraints. The protocol wizard can be used to efficiently validate the proposed pre route topology and routing constraints. The post layout electrical verification using hyperlinks DRC helps finding issues in large systems quickly. The automated 3D extraction and pattern matching sets up large SERDI systems for manageable validation. The protocol compliance wizard validates the final design to a specific standard. Okay, let's loop back and see if we've got the answers to all of the original issues we discussed. I do believe that now we can answer those questions. Let's look at each of them. So, the first question was, how do I know if the implementation is possible? Well, line sim service wizard protocol wizards are the tools that will help you to find the best solution. How much variability can I have in the layout? Run Swiss or use the 3D Explorer? What if I don't have models for my drivers or I don't know what the drivers will be yet? Since the protocol wizard does not require models, this is not a problem. How do I quickly validate an interface to a protocol standard? Simply use the protocol wizard. How can I model a long, high-speed channel with 3D features in a reasonable amount of time? The 3D Area Manager, 2D and 3D Hybrid Simulations and Pattern Matching are features designed for this purpose. How can I easily find problems in many service channels in my design? Hyperlinks DRC is the solution. How can I model and simulate hundreds of service lines? By using the proprietary 3D pattern matching algorithm in the hybrid simulation. Great. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Christian. Thank you again for having me.
And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find more information about this topic from Mentor, a Siemens company. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. Can't miss it right there on the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.